Hello again, art history students. Welcome to uh, Unit 2, Lecture 5. This is the last lecture in uh, this sort of early art unit. We're going to talk about the art of ancient Greece. So a couple of quick notes about the Greek culture and kind of what's important to them because that will be reflected in their art. So um, Greece is a very athletic and intellectual culture. Philosophy, math, the sciences are all very, very important to them and that is reflected in their art. This is the birthplace of democracy. Uh, Greek philosophers are the first to speculate the nature and purpose of art. So why do human beings make art? And there's kind of this there's this evolution that comes from that question, especially when in terms of kind of like the art in the sacred realm and then art in sort of the realm that we exist in. I know that's kind of been a theme or a thread that's been coming through all five of these lectures. They took a lot of pride in their achievements. And so specifically in the portrayal of the idealized human body and then the mathematical systems that they apply to their art specifically to the idealized human body and then also to architecture so we're going to get into all of this information and kind of digest it a little bit more this is the map that we've kind of referenced to several times during this um, unit i want you to note that as the Greeks are making their art, which is here, sorry, I circled the, um, as they're making their art, everything is still going on in Egypt down here, in Mesopotamia, and then also as we talked about those other cultures that are developing in the East, in Asia. So all these things are happening simultaneously, even though we're talking about them in this very separate way. I just wanna keep refreshing that idea. All right, so Greek art is broken down into three basic sections, and this differs from how we've talked about Mesopotamia and the Aegean cultures and all the other. I haven't really made you guys decipher the difference, but for the Greeks, I will. You need to know archaic, classical, and Hellenistic art and kind of what's changing for each of them. So. You may want to, I don't know, make a note, take notes. All right, so these are some other terms that may uh, come up in just a little bit, bit, but I wanted to put them in text for you because there wasn't really space in the other slides. So let's start with the archaic period. The archaic period does deal a lot with uh, pottery. That's the main art that's being made at this time. And Basically what we're gonna be talking about is the artwork that exists on all of these different storage vessels. So the archaic period, when I was in school and studying art history was referred to as the geometric period. Um, so I may say that, uh, and just note that that's just like a slip of the tongue. I mean to say archaic period. So what we're looking at here is artwork that's kind of familiar and very influenced by Egyptian art. We kind of see this breakdown of space by the use of registers, right? Even in the patterning that's up here on the neck of um, this storage vessel and kind of the use of twisted perspective is definitely there. We kind of see the feet and that, that eye, that classic eyeball on the side of the head that's coming about. So very influenced by the art of ancient Egypt and a lot of things that are very familiar to us as far as terminology and whatnot. There would be use of hierarchical scale. All those kind of things are present in the archaic period. So here there are a couple things I want to digest with this first off. So we see all those same kind of things, that use of, of registers and kind of the breaking down of space. So this um, jar this amphora is kind of bulbous it's coming out into space but there's this kind of like they're trying to flatten it right and that's again that kind of influence from ancient egypt is coming over so we have these two figures here which are achilles and ajax as they're playing a game 
the Greeks were massive storytellers. Their stories of their uh, sacred realm stories, right? The stories of the pantheon of their gods and how the pantheon of the gods would interfere, interfere and influence and have sort of a connection to the real world that people exist in was very, very important. And we'll talk more about that as we go forward. What I want to note about this container is this kind of orangey marbled color is the color of the clay. And the figures that are painted on it are with black um, slip, right? So that's the official chart. You don't need to know that. But the figure is black. And then the background or the negative space is the color of the natural clay. So this is referred to as black figure wear which is different than red figure wear, which is basically the reverse. The natural clay color is the figure, right? This kind of orangey marble again. And then the background is what's painted black. So they kind of mirror each other, but you need to know, it should be very easy for you on a test to figure out the difference between red figure wear and black figure wear. You almost probably didn't need me to explain it to get that. So everybody's gonna get that test question right. Am I right? Containers oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes came in this dual um, sets like this, where one would be black figure and one would be red figure, but they would have very similar imagery uh, to them, right? So again, these are kind of archaic period, black figure wear, red figure wear, very highly influenced by ancient Egypt. Okay. So there were some other colors that kind of came into the spectrum. It wasn't just always black and red, but this is still considered black figure wear because that marbly, orangey clay color is the background and the figures are what's depicted with using what's known as a slit. So again, we're kind of seeing a lot of use of the registers as we break down the space. I absolutely love this um, piece. We kind of have the overlapping of the shields and kind of that dual color. For this artwork only having really three colors to it, there's a lot going on and a lot that we can see and perceive. So love Greek pottery. All right, next we're gonna talk about the transition between the archaic period to the classical period. Right. So here's some, again, um, a big key term that we're going to talk a lot about, and there's actually a whole video on, is contraposto. So contraposto, you're going to need to know that term. Just so also to point out, this is considered the height of Greek art, the classical period is, right? We talked last time about that kind of the sort of arch of prosperity and then the arch of art as they kind of go together, right? So this is kind of that one of those peaks, you could put it in the same category as flameware pottery, but I don't know if I would say it quite like that, but I would say it's the height. Okay, so we're talking about the stylistic changes between the archaic period and the classical period. So this is a typical archaic period. This is known as a koros or a youth statue. Usually when a um, young boy would pass away, specifically in battle, that was kind of the, the ultimate, I don't wanna say the ultimate way to pass away, but there was like a, a high level of honor associated in passing away in battle. So a family would erect one of these koros or youth statues, um, in memoriam of their son who would have passed away. And sometimes there would be one statue that would be erected for a multitude of sons, or um, I just want you to note that this is not specifically a depiction, right? This is not a, like this, not a representation of this specific boy. This is an idealized representation of the youth who would pass away in battle, right? This is kind of a, I don't want to say it's like a sacred realm kind of thing, but to pass away in your youth, at the peak of your life, in the prime of your life, right? That's kind of what's being conveyed in these early statues. We see a lot of influence from ancient Egypt, 
right? If you remember back to the statue of the pharaoh Men Menkorma, Menkorman and his uh, queen, um, Kamirbethi, right? They kind of have that same stance, that, that shoulders square, the one foot just in front of the other foot, right? And this kind of slight movement, all of the weight is equally distributed on both legs. And then if you remember back to those images that we would have seen for the Aegean cultures, which are the pre-Greek culture, right? There's kind of this upside down triangle that represents the torso. So we're seeing everything that we have kind of talked about before being represented in this image. And then everything changes when we get to the classical moment, right? This body looks completely different than the other one. All of the weight is distributed on one leg. This other leg kind of just has the toes on the ground. There isn't all the weight of the body isn't placed on that. And then the shoulders have this, the shoulders are going kind of this way and the hips are going this way, right? Kind of elongated on one side and then kind of squished on the other, right? This has to do with the spine. This is the way that people actually stand. No one really stands with their weight equally distributed on each leg. It's just not how normal people stand. If you're standing for a long time with your friends talking or something, you're going to shift the weight from one leg to the other. That's just the normal way that we stand. So there's this much more attention paid to the naturalization of the body and how the body is represented. All right, so there is an entire video linked maybe above or below this one, which is the impact of the contrapposto stance. And I want you guys to watch that video. It's going to go into much more detail about the contrapposto stance than I want to in this video. I want to try to keep them kind of short and then also going to give you guys a little bit of reference of what's to come and how this contrapposto stance is going to move forward into time. So there's a little bit of, I know, we'll call it foreshadowing, you know what I mean, of what's to come, but it just shows and really puts forward the impact of the contrapposto stance. So watch that. Another thing to point out is the influence of form in the round here at this time. Um, in Almost all of the cultures and all of the art that we've seen before, with, with some exceptions, art has been kind of this, there's one side and then the other side, right? There's a side that you're supposed to see um, and a side that's supposed to be presented to you, right? That's one of the reasons why those bodies look so rigid as they stand and look forward, the ancient Egyptian sculptures. And even the sculpture of um, the one pharaoh with the god Horus, who's kind of has his wings over his head. He's seated in that image, but or in that sculpture, but you really could only kind of view it from three sides, right? The two profile sides and then the front facing view. Something that happens in Greek art is this explosion of form in the round. This image is dynamic and can be viewed from all sides. And you're supposed to walk around it and view it from all sides, taking in every little detail, right? As it's kind of sitting. So this is Aphrodite crouching at her bath. So I want you to kind of associate this with a three-dimensional view that you as the viewer make an entire cycle around it. So form in the round. All right, so next we're going to talk about material and we're going to talk about bronze. So a lot, all of these, most of, I don't like to say all because then I feel like I'm boxing it in, but almost all Greek sculptures were made out of bronze. And then when the Romans considered themselves the inheritors of the Greek art tradition, they often remade Greek sculptures in marble, right? Almost exactly as far as we would know, they, they replicate them almost exactly. So sometimes a lot of the statues that you may see, specifically the previous ones when we talked about the um, shift between the archaic and then the classical, those would be 
have been redone by the Greeks. So, or redone by the Romans. Yeah. All right. So what we're talking about now is how art is made. And again, we're kind of talking about at what we would consider a peak time, right? A peak time of prosperity, a peak time of intellectual development, a peak time of culture, right? Culture and prosperity. So here we have this statue of the warrior, right? Of this warrior. And he is in a very idealized human form. He has that contrapposto stance, right? Where his weight is mainly on one of his legs. He's very idealized. He has ivory inlaid into his eyes. But what I want to really focus on is how this sculpture was made. It was made through a process called lost wax bronze casting, right? It's a very long, complicated process. And if you're thinking to yourself, why are you telling, going to be telling us all of these stages of this? It's to show how much work really went into these. So what they started off with was kind of this wooden, rough wooden body. And then they would add a layer of clay and maybe like sawdust to it to pack around the body. Then the entire form was coated in a thick layer of beeswax. And that beeswax would be what they would carve all those individual fingernails and toenails. Uh, this sculpture has this beautiful beard and hair. All of those little teeny tiny intricate details would have been made in this wax layer. Then the whole thing is coated in plaster. All right. So there's plaster put around the entire thing. Then this is kind of a kiln representation. All these little wavy things represent heat. The wax and the sawdust and the wood and the clay is very slowly burned out of that plaster cast, right? So that plaster. So then you have a basically a hollow form of plaster. Then hot molten bronze is poured into that hollow shell right where all these stages would have been before and then finally that plaster piece is broken away and you have the completed statue right this is complicated to say the least but it's important i want you to put that into context of how much energy and effort was being put into the making of this art. These were the first people to say or to wonder is art important and what is its purpose in life and what is its relationship to human beings. They pondered this intellectually and then obviously they felt that it was incredibly important to put this much energy and effort and resources and technology and thought of how to even do such a thing. It is worth noting that this process is also the process that would have been was invented, I guess, to make a lot of weapons. So it wasn't like this process was developed for art, but it was really perfected for art. I will say it that way. So this is another lost wax bronze cast statue, and this is a representation of Poseidon, it could be Zeus, and I always try to make sure that, uh, you know, there's full kind of honesty in the information that I'm putting forward. So this may be Zeus. I think the likelihood is that it's Poseidon. He more than likely would have had his sort of trident thing, right, that uh, Poseidon is famous for holding, but it could have been a lightning bolt because it could be Zeus. So if you look at this body, you think, it's a very idealized body, right? That was very important to the Greeks. Athleticism and sort of physical prowess was very important. But there's also something that might be ever so slightly off. So there is this golden ratio, which is this, the Greeks believed they, A, they invented this, and then also they believed that this golden ratio was perfect. And you may or may not have learned about this or seen this in math class or anything like that. This does occur um, a lot of times in nature. The human body does not have these exact proportions. But when the Greeks thought about the idealized human body or the uh, human bodies that would exist in the sacred realm that the gods would have, 
they would have had perfect bodies or idealized bodies. So thus, this ratio would be applied to the human body. So we look back to that sculpture of Poseidon or Zeus, and we see that it has the golden ratio applied to it. Now, like I said before, regular human bodies don't fit into this proportion exactly, but they do look very close. Right? I think the best place to see it, at least where I see kind of the oddness, is in this arm here. If he were to put his arm down, it would almost, where his fingertips would almost reach to his knees, which is not, again, not how human beings really are. But this isn't a depiction of a human being. It's a depiction of a god. It's a sacred depiction. And thus, it would have this ratio applied to it. This will probably be on the test. So this ratio is applied everywhere, in every detail, right? So here we are back at this kind of first image that we saw for the classical period, right? Again, it's after a bronze original. The Romans would have remade this artwork. But this golden ratio is applied to every little minute detail of a depiction of the gods, right? That's, that's something that I want to make real clear images of regular people don't get this golden ratio application to them it's only depictions of the the gods which are kind of considered above right they're in the sacred realm right it's kind of a theme that we've been going with in this uh thing i also like how this is broken all right so we're going to take kind of a quick sidestep and talk about architecture, but don't worry, we're going to circle back to that golden ratio. So we're talking about the evolution of architecture. So before when we talked about a span, right, we talked about the post and lentil construction, which had this kind of basic layout, right? These are the, the posts at the bottom and the lentil. But if you try to apply weight to this lentil, after a certain span is created, after a certain distance, it can't handle that weight and it will break right there. So what the Greeks did was they invented what's called the corbelled arch. It's kind of the next evolution in um, the architecture that we're tracking specifically for this class. And what this does is this takes all this weight that's up here and pushes it down like this and then down to the ground. So there's no weight that's being applied to the lentil right there. So this is the entrance to the treasury at Athens. So there is a lentil that goes across here, but it is not bearing the weight. This is the corbelled part up here, this triangle. So just note that all the weight of all these bricks and whatnot is kind of being pushed like this and then down to the ground. It's going to make, you know, it's going to all come back around. Trust me, when we get to um, sort of the Gothic era, all these weird little architectural evolutions will be, oh, yeah, now I see. I understand why we did it like that. Just trust me. All right. So next, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, again, about Greek life. So the Greeks kind of lived in, or so lived surrounding what they called the Acropolis. So the Acropolis is this elevated area that would have a temple and this would also be where government buildings would be, this is where educational buildings would be, this would be like the city center of culture, right? And then people would live kind of around it. So this is a multi-purpose kind of thing similar to a citadel and I, I want to make sure you know you guys kind of know this is also a cultural center but then also used as like a defensive position because the greeks did have a lot of end fighting amongst themselves and then you know other surrounding areas and whatnot there was pretty pretty calm battle was a pretty common thing so i just kind of put this in there you don't need to know this term for the test or anything but it is to give you just some context and that's what creating context is what art is about all right so 
the Greeks were polytheistic. I know you guys know that word, and you're probably familiar from with some of the Greek gods and some of the stories just from general popular culture. Maybe you've talked about them in some other classes or something. We're not going to dive too deep into a lot of the stories, but storytelling and this oral tradition of the gods, who the gods are, and what the gods are like is central to the art of 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 the ancient Greeks, right? It's central to life for them. Okay, so next we are going to talk about, and we kind of touched on this last time uh, when we talked about the ancient Egyptians. I told you guys about the capitals, right? So this is the temple to Athena Nike, right? And it has these um, pillars, these columns in front of it. And then the top of them is decorated in this very specific way, which is called Ionic. So let's go to the next slide. There are four, or there are three different capital orders, all right, for the ancient Greeks. So get your pens out, because you're going to want to take notes at this moment. And I am going to tell you how I remembered these as a student. It uh, might be kind of silly, but I promise you, you will not forget it. And then when you go out into the real world and you go to the library or to the, you know, some kind of government building or something like that, and you see columns with these capitals, you're going to see them everywhere. I never knew that these were, but they're everywhere. They're on libraries and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to can I tell the difference between those now? So the first is Doric. It's sort of believed to be the first that kind of evolved chronologically. So Doric is a rectangle, and this is how I remembered it in school, and you can laugh if you want to, but a like 19 kind of 50s term for a nerd or a dork was a square. That's what uh, they used to, to call dorks. I guess was squares. So that's how I remember Doric is the rectangle by the square. Ionic, right? Ions kind of swirl, they got protons and neutrons or something, and they kind of move in this spiral shape. So there's kind of two of them coming together. So that's ionic. And then Corinthian, the actual reason for this term is this capital order was developed in a place called Cornith. So that's why it's called Corinthian, but it's very floral. It has these leaves and maybe some kind of like flower bud or something coming off the top of it. And I think Corinthian, doesn't that sound like a flower that your grandma would grow in her garden or, or your mom or yourself? You know, it's, it sounds like a flower. So that's how I remembered the difference between Doric, Ionic and Corinthian you everybody is different your brain is different if you want to come up with your own system go for it um i'd love if you shared your system um with your classmates or with myself so these will be on the test you will need to identify each of these so prepare yourself all right this is the Parthenon. So the last temple that we talked about was the temple to Athena Nike, and that was a temple to one specific god. The Parthenon is a large uh, temple that is devoted to all of the gods in Athens. And Akintos and Kiliocrates, sorry, I want to say those names, those are the architects who developed this building. And just like in depictions of the gods, that golden ratio was applied to kind of communicate that this was a god and that they were perfect, or this was a deity from the sacred realm and they were perfect. The golden ratio is also going to be applied to this building, right? They applied it to everything they created that specifically deals with the gods, right? So this is how the golden ratio is applied to this building. There's this nice little graphic for that. So it's all the way from these tiny little sections all the way up to just the larger size in general of the building. And even though you can kind of see that it's in ruin there or kind of falling into disarray, 
there when it was created it would have been lavishly painted and decorated and we're going to get into that now so there's quite a bit of vocabulary that i'm throwing at you guys in this lecture so i want to make sure i point out what's important and what's not so this is this building has a doric order right the um, parthenon is a doric order this section here which i'm going to draw on this is the frieze right so all of this little section here i don't want to say little it's kind of a large section is what's known as a frieze and a frieze is basically a um a horizontal kind of span of decoration and it's broken up into these different sections which are called meadows. we're going to see some of those in a moment and then this obtuse triangle is called the cornice we're going to see that in a moment too and then again the capital which is what dictates that this is doric order so that's what you need to know so you should know the cornice you should know the frieze and you should know the capital you should this is a column or a shaft you, you don't really need to know that for the test but you should should probably just have known that that's that's a that's a column or a shaft okay and then meadow so let's move on and kind of explore the meadows so again we talked about how the greeks were avid storytellers and the stories that their gods and their sort of the gods had influence on our lives and their actions are sometimes what would result in various prosperities or problems for everyday human beings and they had a plethora of stories about their deities you can kind of think of the greeks view of depiction of their sacred you know their gods their deities was that they were kind of like extreme versions of human beings right if we have you know a a good body that's as an athletic body and whatnot and can do and perform all these things they had the perfect body right if we have emotions and feelings they have extreme emotions and feelings we have intellect they have extreme intellect right very extreme versions of human beings an over exaggeration of the human um the being a human being which is part of the reason why their stories and their traditions have kind of permeated all throughout history like i said at the beginning you're probably more familiar with greek stories than you might be with ancient egyptian stories of their gods and deities right probably okay here is another of the parthenon friezes right so i just want to point out like we pointed out during this kind of foreshadowing for something to come this exists in the british museum right it doesn't actually exist in greece any longer and most of the meadows don't so then we talked about that cornice right just just for clarity's sake this completed cornice that you see here which would have all these figures on it is not from the parthenon it's actually from the temple of zeus specifically so we see this lined up of all these um gods and goddesses and other sort of mythological characters right some are human animal hybrids here's kind of a a detail shot so we see some centaurs here right so some are human animal hybrids but they're all kind of um again depicted with that golden ratio in mind even though it might not be obvious it is definitely in there because they are depictions of those sacred realm characters and then it exists in that cornice so i put this in even though this is maybe not the best artist rendering of potential of what the temple of zeus may have looked like i want you to know that these things would have been vibrantly painted we see them and they're all white because they're made out of marble and they're all kind of um in this ru like ruined state but i want you to remember a lot of what i'm asking you guys to do in this art history class is try to understand the context so these would have been painted boldly vibrantly probably a little gaudy to our 
uh, aesthetic taste today, we'd probably be like, wow, you got to lay off the, the bright colors and the gold. But remember, the the gods or the deities are kind of an extreme version. So they would have kind of this bright colors and this is central to ancient Greek life. All right, so the last of the three stages, that was the classical stage, is the Hellenistic. So here we have this sculpture, which is of Lacoon and his sons. So I will give you the super brief version of this story. So Lacoon is a priest, and he knows, if you've ever heard this story of, um, now I've like totally lost my words, the Trojan horse. There we go. So the story of the Trojan horse is where the Greeks make this giant fake uh, horse and present it as a gift to their rival. And secretly they're hidden inside of it. Um, and then when everybody goes to sleep at night, they all crawl out of the giant Trojan horse and slaughter everyone. So it's kind of like this very deceptive story. So Lacoon and is a priest and he is aware of this plot. And he doesn't feel that this, he feels it's, it's very deceptive and dishonorable. So he wants to go and warn um, the rival army. So he takes his sons, but the gods intervene. And it's in multiple different versions of the story. In one version, it's Poseidon. And then in another version, it's a different uh, goddess who decides to intervene. But either way, the gods intervene and they send all of these um, kind of like serpents. Uh, they're not just snakes. They're sea serpents that are incredibly powerful to rip apart Lacoon and his sons and stop them from warning the rival army of this kind of deceptive situation. So what we're seeing here is this this sculpture has an exaggerated pose, right? It has this theatrical quality. It's very, very over the top, right? This man is a muscular man, but it is like every muscle in his body is bulging at the same time, right? This emphasis of the drama. This is the most dramatic part of that story that's being depicted. The part where the sea creatures or serpents tear his body apart is very, very dramatic, right? So the Hellenistic period emphasizes that drama. Right, that over exaggeration of form, over exaggeration of the story, right? Just the whole idea of drama is front and center. Especially look at his face, right? The the, the just the horror and the terror that's being depicted on that face. It's it's crying out with every single one of its muscles. So this artwork will definitely come back. We will see this artwork um, a couple times in this class, believe it or not, even as we go through history. So also note that this is a copy of the bronze original. So this would have been made in that super complicated lost wax bronze casting process that we would have that we talked about a little bit earlier in the lecture and then was remade by the Romans in marble. This is another Hellenistic artwork. This is uh, Winged Victory Nike. This would have been presented on a stone boat is what this kind of, kind of like, if you see, I don't know, like a pirate movie, there's always kind of like a, a figure of a woman at the bow of a ship or something. That's where this would have been, but it was not a real ship. It was like a symbolic stone ship. So there's sort of this flight that's taken. We can kind of see all of the action and drama again. Even though this body is not in motion, it's stone, it's static, there's a significant amount of motion and action, especially if all those layers of fabric kind of move around the legs of the figure, the winged victory, Nike, right? She's not in flight, but we get the sensation that she is just from looking at this sculpture. All right, last but not least is the boxer at rest. 
So this is from the Hellenistic period also. So this is not a depiction of a deity. This is a depiction of a regular man. And one of the reasons that I spent so much time talking about the lost wax bronze casting process is to make you or help you understand the real importance of the body and of physicality and of athleticism to the Greeks. And this sculpture does that above all. So here we see this boxer. He's kind of down. He's looking up. He looks tired. Look how his hands are kind of resting on his body. He looks like he's kind of breathing heavy, right? He's obviously in great physical shape and whatnot. But if we look at his face, we can see that his face is kind of torn up like he's been battered and bruised, right? The Greeks were the ones who invented um, the Olympics, right? So again, I can't stress this enough, athletic prowess was incredibly important to the Greeks. And then also what we see here is this depiction here of an open wound. So this is copper. Just so you guys know, bronze is a alloy of copper and tin. So pure copper is a little bit more of an orangey kind of red color. So during the process where they would have made this the, the uh, beeswax layer, right? If you remember just from a couple minutes ago where there's this whole layer of the sculpture that's beeswax, and then they, um, because that's where they do all these little details of all these little hairs in the face and whatnot. They would have set in copper pieces or at least carved out an area where this copper piece would then be inset into there. And that copper represents the, the blood coming out, right? This is an incredibly minute detail to put in, but I think it really pushes forward how important physicality was, the being human was to the ancient Greeks, right? Now in their stories and in their traditions, there were animal human hybrids like the centaurs and all these other kind of characters. But for the most part, the deities are humans and the gods reflect the people and the values of the people, right? And being human was incredibly important to the Greeks. There was no longer this kind of idea, if you remember all the way back when we talked about prehistoric art, and I showed you guys that image of that animal lion head hybrid, right? And we talked about how human beings were wanting to have these animal attributes. That is completely shifted, right? Human beings are definitely at the top. We're at the top intellectually at the top physically, right? The gods are reflections of human beings. So being human, being depicted in art was incredibly, incredibly important. I know that, that this lecture kind of gets a little bit philosophical by comparison to some of the others, but I think it's, it's really important, especially as we go forward. All right, so these are the key terms it got really dark in here. So you guys, there is a test on unit um, two that you need to uh, take and pay attention to those dates and then also your discussion for this week. Email me if you have any questions. Thank you.